everyone, this is Wanda Alger, and today is Tuesday, March 12th. I have some fresh prophetic intel uh, to share with you today that came uh, in this last week that's going to be giving some directives specifically to prayer concerning April 8, this eclipse that we are expecting, and then what that sign indicates that we are headed into in the next couple of months. There's a lot of conjecture. There's uh, numerous prophetic words, things that are being shared online about uh, what April 8, what this eclipse really means. It really wasn't on my radar a whole lot. I had seen some of the videos that had been posted, uh, but I wasn't really paying attention uh, until March 8, a couple of nights ago, and I had a dream. And so I want to share this dream with you and then a subsequent word, very strong word that the Lord gave and uh, what I think it means. Okay. First of all, I, I want to start with this scripture in Psalm 19, one and two, it says the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork day to day pours out speech and night to night reveals knowledge. There's some hidden gems in there. The heavens have a lot to teach us. Now, I'm not talking about horoscopes, but I'm talking about stars and constellations. I mean, he God, God created them all and he does nothing by chance. And night to night reveals knowledge. I believe that he is speaking to us in the heavens. And again, though I have not been a stargazer and I've not been one that usually watches things, I do pay attention when the Lord brings it to me. And so that's what happened on March 8. It was a very short dream, but it was I was sitting at a park table with several other people, and the night sky above us was massive and filled with many stars and constellations. And I was describing an experience that I just had in prayer. And I, I knew that something could be unlocked in the heavens if I focused my prayers rightly. And there was just a sense in the dream that even though others had approached this whole thing differently, I was specifically supposed to focus on the Lord, on Jesus, on the creator of the heavens. And I knew that this was key in connecting heaven and earth. And so I had done this through prayer. And when I did it, something got triggered and activated because the heavens came alive. Uh, because my focused declarations were to the Lord and to the creator, I saw things just start happening in the heavens. I saw two different falling stars. I saw fireworks start in different places. I saw other things move and shift. I could tell that it was because of my focused prayers that something had, had been uh, activated. And so I was so excited about this display of God that I'd, I was telling my friends and I wanted to write some kind of prayer uh, for others because there was some kind of big event coming that uh, everyone was paying attention to. And I thought it'd be a perfect opportunity for some prayers that could be used uh, to see what God wanted to, wanted to say. And so that's how I woke up. And immediately upon waking, I, I felt like this was an invitation to prayer. I mean, I, I immediately thought about the eclipse. If there's any big event, you know, that's talking about heavenly things, it must be that. And yet this whole call to pray, uh, because in the dream, that's what I was left with, is that there was something, uh, some directed prayers that were going to be key in what was going to take place. And initially, uh, you know, even by the scriptures uh, talking about the heavens, declare the glory of God, uh, just the reality you know, stars are alive. Anything that God creates has life. It's his life in them. And they speak. And this sense of just that joining of heaven and earth and, and declaring the glory of the Lord, because especially globally right now, there are many uh, spiritual uh, adversaries who are speaking much different things to creation and even to the heavens. And so this is, you know, part of the charge is that we uh, we are charged to, to declare his glory uh, in his creation. So I had a general sense of what this dream was saying, but I knew, okay, this is incomplete. I thought, okay, Lord, you got to give me a little more here uh, to know what you want me to do. It was three days later on March 11, right before I woke up, I both heard very clearly, and it was, it was so clear, it could have been an audible voice, but, but it wasn't. But I both heard it and saw it in print. And that was the phrase, the fiery arrow of Enoch. Now I had no clue as to what that was, but as soon as I woke up, I knew it was a prophetic marker and I 
thought of the dream. I thought, Lord, is this something referencing the dream? But the fiery arrow of Enoch, what is that? Well, I went right to scriptures. And of course, Enoch is mentioned several times uh, you know, in scriptures, obviously in the Old Testament. He walked with God. He was known to be so close to the Lord. He did not die a physical death. The Lord just took him. And uh, there is then a book of Enoch, which is an apocryphal book, uh, which many would regard as fantastical. It has no, you know, real authority in terms of spiritual meaning. But in the New Testament, the book of Enoch is cited at least one time, I think two times. And it's very clear that in the in the early church, again, they didn't have the canon that we do, and they didn't even have the New Testament. They had many of the Old Testament books, and they had many of these apocryphal books. And so even by the mention of the book Enoch in the New Testament should tell us it carried some weight. There was some, some authority. And I, I'd encourage you to find a copy. You can find them online uh, of the book of Enoch. I've read it uh, numerous times. And yes, it's very extra biblical. This is a prophet, okay? And it's all about supernatural stuff. I mean, it's fascinating read, if nothing else. But anyway, so that's a, a little backdrop uh, of Enoch. But if you look in the book of Jude, verses 14 to 23, it references a prophecy of Enoch, a prophecy that Enoch spoke to a future generation. And as soon as I read this portion of scripture, I knew immediately this prophecy was the fiery arrow that the Holy Spirit was wanting to reference. That, that prophetic word that he spoke into our time, he shot it forth from his generation into the future as an arrow, as a word, a directed word. And the Lord wanted us to pay attention to it. But there's a reason why. So if you go to Jude 1, 14 to 15, and I'm, uh, I always read out of the English Standard Version, says it was also about these, that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. And then it goes on to list, you know, many of these things that uh, these sinners have, have done that are wrong. And it's letting the reader know God's not going to put up with this. This is in the latter times. You can expect to see this, but God's going to judge this, okay? And then he goes on in verses 20 to 23. Jude then, after citing this prophecy of Enoch, reminding uh, believers, this is what we can expect. This level of sin that is so rampant, it's going to uh, require heaven's intervention. That's how bad it is. Then Jude says, now, <laughs> beloved, you building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life and have mercy on those who doubt, save others by snatching them out of the fire to others show mercy with fear eating even the garment stained by the flesh. When I read that, I knew that these are prayer directives. And I felt that the Lord was directing me to this prophecy of Enoch pointing to this time and showing us how to pray in answer to the dream. That God is doing something in this day and in this time. There is He is executing justice and a level of judgment that he wants us to realize because of the rampant sin. And he's wanting us to know though, how to posture ourselves in prayer so that his purposes can be accomplished. So we're going to unpack this, but I want to, I want to first talk about what are we talking about when, when we're saying God's judgment, because if you really read the book of, of Enoch, uh, he cites, you know, it as a final judgment. Now I personally don't believe that this has to be read as this means it's the end. This judgment that, that Enoch is referring to has to mean this is the end. Because I really didn't sense that either the dream nor the word about the fiery arrow of Enoch was supposed to be a prediction of a doomsday timeline of sorts. I didn't feel that that was God's purpose. 
God's purpose, because of his reference to prayer, was to point to how we are supposed to posture ourselves in prayer during this time. Because I, I believe there is a time of judgment, not the final one. You know, judgment comes in numbers of ways. The word of God brings judgment. God's ways brings an automatic judgment. When we don't follow his ways, when we don't live according to his word and his will, we, you know, it's sowing and reaping. There is a judgment there of sorts. There's also God's wrath. And that's another whole discussion. Bobby and I have been talking about this, you know, in terms of even what is happening now, because it, there is a wrath of God and that is a righteous indignation. It is God's anger. And, you know, whether or not there's a, I believe, you know, if you really dig into the weeds, okay, and that, that's not my purpose here to really study what the scripture talks about the wrath of God and the judgment of God, I believe there's some differences there. But the context in which I am reading this all and why I, I believe that the Lord is bringing it to us, and this goes along with other prophetic words that have been spoken in the last number of years and things that the Lord has already shown me that really bear witness that even since 2020, in the last three years, there has never been a time before in history where we have been so globally connected and globally aware of the level of evil, of wickedness, of corruption. Now, maybe globally it has happened before in times past, but there's never been a time because of the internet, because of technology, where we have been globally aware that the, the entire earth is has been impacted by the seed of Satan, by the enemy's venom, literally. Never before has there been a time in history. That is why this is such a historical time and why it is so significant that when there are scripture references about God, you know, wanting to speak to the earth and to his creation, we are in that time right now. And what is what have we seen happen in the last couple of years as the Lord has been waking up the church and the people to the ungodliness, to the seed of Satan, to what the enemy has been doing, an awakening to this injustice, to the corruption. I mean, thank God many people have woken up to realize there is an enemy that, that wants us dead, that, that wants to kill us and destroy us. And, and we need to rise up and take action. We need to pray. We need to overturn this. And so we have seen that. But the one thing that we have yet to see globally is the, the wicked and the ungodly, the tyrants, the abusers, truly be brought to justice. Now, I believe, like many of you, that much has been happening that the public is not aware of, that there have been sentences rendered, there have been judgments rendered by men's courts, okay, by, the, by our civil authorities, whereby many of these people have been dealt with. But, you know, there's there's man's judgment and then there's God's judgment. And I believe that, you know, if you look at the big picture and the global awareness that we have, we have yet to see the level of justice that we are all crying out for. The level of, of you know, these people answering for the sins committed. And I believe that it is this that the Lord has been speaking to in many ways in the last number of years through the prophets, through intercessors, you know, vindication is coming. Uh, I've shared numerous times a, a dream that I had two years ago where I saw Obama and Hillary. I mean, they they fell dead before a judge's bench. And the Lord said, your eyes will see what your ears have heard. I knew he was saying, you will see justice rendered against those who, I mean, they were symbolic of those who stand against and who who stand against him and who have rebelled against him consistently and repeatedly. There is justice coming. And I didn't get any sense in that dream, nor in any of the others that I've had in, in this regard, that it was referencing a final judgment, like the end, you know, story closed. It was always as another chapter in the story. And so that's what I, I believe that the Lord is, is drawing attention to, even in this fiery arrow of Enoch, this prophecy of Enoch is letting us know all of heaven is getting ready to intervene because of our prayers. And there's going to be a level of, of judgment upon the ungodly. 
and it's going to unleash a fear of the Lord. I've prophesied about this before. Others have prophesied. Many intercessors, we, we sense this coming, a heavy fear of the Lord upon the land. And I believe it's going to come because his justice, God's justice, judgment, wrath, whatever terms you want to put to it, he is going to demonstrate that. But not as a sign of the end, but he is going to do it to display he indeed is the sovereign ruler. He indeed is the final judge. And it's going to be an ushering in then of a time when the Holy Spirit is going to be poured out. The fear of the Lord is going to be so tangible. It is going to turn millions away from the darkness and into the light because there will be no more doubt as to who the final arbiter is. There will be no more doubt as to his intentions, both of his love for those who are righteous, because I believe there's going to be an equal proportion, blessing and favor poured upon poured out upon those who have been faithful, who have stood in righteousness and truth, and who have believed what he has said. Just as he is also going to come and render his judgments against those who have refused, consistently refused. I believe that this is what Enoch's prophecy is pointing to. Now, it it, it may yet point to that final judgment. I, I Again, I'm not trying to uh, make a strong theological stance. I'm putting it within the context of what God has already been speaking in these last number of years, given the global stage and where we are at in this time in history. I believe this is an invitation to prepare the way through our prayers, that we are going to be entering a time of discipline and correction, but it is unto then an invitation, an invitation to change, to come up higher, to leave those ways behind, to say no to the, the evildoers, to say no to the darkness and to come into the light, to come into the truth and, and walk in, in his ways. I believe that that is what that, this invitation is for because we have a part in how that happens. There's been a lot of conjecture as to what this you know, eclipse on April 8 might mean. You know, you've probably seen some of the videos I've been sent them. I've seen some others on social media, uh, you know, referencing the, the 2017 eclipse, you know, and the X across the United States. And then this one that's going to mark, uh, you know, make an X because it's traveling the other way. All of the towns that it's going through and the prophetic significance of them. And, and I'm not discounting any of them. Uh, but let's face it. Nobody knows for sure. All that I know is that this is an invitation for us to pray because God is doing something. This is not the end. He is giving us a sign in the heavens to prepare to display his glory. The heavens declare the glory of God. There is going to be a connection between heaven and earth through our prayers and our proclamations. So if you go on then and read, you know, in Jude verses 20 to 23, I list here seven different things that he instructs us. If we want to prepare, then this is how we do it. And it's very simple. Build yourselves up in your most holy faith. This is so key. We have to be anchored in the truth. We have to be anchored in the word of God. I've said this over and over again. If we're going to have the stability that's needed to walk through whatever this year holds, and again, there are there have been things prophesied that it's going to get worse before it gets better. We've heard about the rumors, the whole internet, you know, shutting down, we could be without power for a month or who knows how long, all kinds of things, you know, stock market crash, financial collapse, who knows what's going to happen. But regardless, the instruction is we need to be anchored in our faith. We are not going to be moved or changed by our circumstances because it's, it's probably going to be different depending upon where you live anyway. But we've got to be anchored in our faith in God. He is a good God. Secondly, pray in the Holy Spirit. Now this, we can pray according to the word of God. And, you know, we're always praying in the spirit, hopefully, when we're in prayer, because we're, we're inviting the Holy Spirit to come to give us revelation as to how to pray. But I would suggest this goes beyond just praying, you know, listening to the spirit, but actually praying in our spiritual language, praying in tongues, praying in the spirit, because that is a weapon when we don't know how to pray. And let's face it. There's so many unknowns, things that we can't know, things that I don't think the Lord wants us to know. We don't need to know. This is where praying in our spiritual language is so powerful. 
Because when we get in that, that mode of just letting the Holy Spirit pray through us, we are praying God's perfect will. And it is so needed. And it doesn't take a lot, but it's that reminder of, again, it is, this is a work of his spirit this very deep. And the enemy can't do anything. When we pray in the spirit, it's just so powerful. Thirdly, it says, keep yourselves in the love of God. We've got to keep our hearts right. Uh, we can't let hope deferred, frustration, bitterness rob us of, of our love, not only for God, but for each other. We have to be motivated by love. What we say, what we preach, what we pray, it all needs to be motivated out of his intense love for his creation. This is why he's doing things the way he is, because he loves us so fiercely. And that's, that's what we need to pray, is that we have his heart. Fourthly, it says, wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. There's a mercy that can only come from the Lord. I mean, let's face it, when we find out of the wickedness of these people, the, the ungodliness, uh, the satanic roots of, of some of these things that are being done, you know, there's no mercy for that. But it says, wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. His mercy leads to eternal life, even for the wicked. And yes, there is time. He does give time for the wicked to repent. I've said recently, especially with the exposures in the, in the church um, and, and even the references to Jezebel and Revelation, where the Lord says, I've given you time to, the, to repent, time is up. I mean, this is how close we are. It's no justice. Judgment has come to the house of the Lord. He's saying your time is up. But he's the one that has to determine that. And so that's where we have to wait on him and his timing. Wait on the mercy of the Lord, because his mercy is always unto eternal life, even for the wicked. And then it says, have mercy on those who doubt. This might be a little bit harder for those who have been contending for a long time on the front lines, who saw things long before anybody else. You knew that 2020 election was stolen. You knew that COVID was a lie. You knew the jabs were dangerous. You know, there's still people that, that don't believe any of that. And it would be very easy to, to get so frustrated. It says, have mercy on them. You know, yeah, I have to think about the disciple Thomas, who, you know, when Jesus rose from the dead, all the other disciples were, were telling him, no, he rose from the dead. Thomas said, I won't believe it until I see the scars in his hand. And when Jesus came to him, Jesus didn't rebuke Thomas or get mad at him. He simply said, well, you know, once Thomas saw and he's okay, I believe, Jesus commended him saying, now that you've seen, you believe. But even more blessed are those who don't see and believe. So perhaps there's something for us to learn there. And even those who doubt, uh, obviously there can be a spirit of unbelief, you know, at work, which that's when we go and pray, you know, because that's, that's the enemy interference. And we don't want that in the lives of our loved ones or our friends who are keeping them from seeing. But we've got to have mercy on those who doubt and pray that they too will come to the light. And then number six, it says, save others by snatching them out of the fire. I think it's a reminder that we cannot afford to be apathetic. You know, if God's compassion is really in us, we should be able to recognize those who literally, they're caught in a fire. They're going to die if we don't, you know, go in and intervene. And of course, you have to ask the Holy Spirit what that looks like, that it's out of love and compassion. You're not rebuking them for their fallen state. But, but your love and compassion is wanting to pull them out and rescue them because you love them. And then seven, it says to others, show mercy with fear. And I think this is a, a reminder that we have to walk in the fear of the Lord. And that even as we are extending mercy, we, we have to guard our own hearts that we're then not caught in the compromise of sin. That in, in our effort to reach someone, that we don't get contaminated. You know, it says... To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. So there is a clear boundary line that has to be there that we can extend mercy, but there's, there's boundaries of grace uh, that we have to be aware of. I, I find it interesting that mercy is referenced numerous times because it is God's mercy that waits on judgment, where our human nature, we want judgment right away. We want the punishment right away. But God, in his mercy, he gives time to repent. And only he can do that. I, that's a supernatural grace. But all of these things, and 
I thought it rather interesting. You know, the way I listed them, it turned out to be seven. I guess you could arrange them differently. But I had to think the number seven, that actually has been coming up a number of times in the last couple of weeks. You'll notice even Enoch is the seventh from Adam. Seven is a number of completion. It also represents the Sabbath rest. And there have been other words that have been spoken about, you know, the, the restoration that's coming and even a jubilee year uh, and a kind of rest to God's people. I believe there's something there. I'm, I'm not going to put too much weight on that. I can just say that I know that number seven has, has been coming up a lot, even in my own healing process. The Lord reminded me of, of Naaman in the Old Testament who wanted healing physically, and he was told to go dip himself in, in the Jordan seven times. Which, which was God's word to me, trust me with how I tell you to do this, even if it's seven times. It, it's how much he is testing our, our ability to obey him and trust him. Things might not come the way that we expect or want, because that's certainly Naaman was just expecting the prophet to lay hands on him and say, be well, and that he'd be done. And so the thought of having to do something seven times, it, God's testing us. And, and I've said this in some of my recent videos, you know, in you contending for healing or deliverance or breakthrough, you've got to listen to the Lord's directives. Even if it seems like it's repetitive or like, why do I have to do it this way? He's testing our willingness to trust him and that we will do things his way and in his time, because that's what he's looking for is obedience. He, you know, we're just looking for the answer. We just want the problem solved. He's looking at our heart and our character and what he is forming in us. So, you know, all of this in, in looking at, you know, the dream that he gave me in, in this word about Enoch's prophecy, I believe this is a call to pray for what we are going to be facing, which we don't really know, but there's obviously enough indicators that we need to be paying attention and that we have an opportunity to stand in the gap for those who are on, you know, who are wavering between two opinions, those who are on the fence. Uh, and for whatever this year looks like, it, this is a volatile year, 2024, huge, massive things uh, for a number of reasons of, of why this is such a significant time, even all the way up through to, you know, November, where there's supposed to be an election. So many things could happen. There's been a lot put out there of what could happen. Again, I don't, I don't think anybody knows for sure, but this is where prayer has to come. And let me just say, too, that, uh, well, let, I'm going to read this last part because I did write this down. Okay, so if you want a written copy of this, you can go to my blog, wandaalger.me, and, and I have it there, and I'll even attach this video along with it so you can share with others. But I said, there's no doubt that God wants to get everyone's attention, even through this April 8 eclipse. But it is not unto the end. Rather, the intervention we are about to see from heaven will be an invitation to change. It will be unmistakable in both its power and its presence. God will make himself known as never before, and it will usher in a time of increased habitation of the Holy Spirit in our midst. Millions will come to know the fear of the Lord and choose to walk in his ways. Even the heavens will speak of his glory, and he is inviting us to take part in this heavenly demonstration of kingly rule and authority. May we pray accordingly. Now, I gave you these seven directives, obviously, that are in the book of Jude. But I also want to reference, again, my, my book, Words to Pray By. The Lord reminded me there's a whole chapter because these uh, all the prayers uh, in here are divided by topics. And I have one whole section, Words for Justice Against the Wicked. And, you know, just to give you an idea, again, of some of the scriptures uh, that the Lord gave me, Psalm 33, 5. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. And here's the prayer. When you deliver your justice, God, may it be the power of your love that receives the most attention. May we be reminded that it is your love that compels you to act with justice. It is your love that defends the weak and punishes those who purposely rebel against the gift you offer them. May the earth be filled with the knowledge of your goodness and love, even in the midst of severe judgments against those who rebel. And then another one is um, Psalm 37, 32 to 34. The wicked lie in wait for the righteous, intent on putting them to death. 
but the Lord will not leave them in the power of the wicked or let them be condemned when brought to trial. Hope in the Lord and keep his way. He will exalt you to inherit the land. When the wicked are destroyed, you will see it. And so the prayer is, thank you, Lord, for championing our freedom as a nation. You will not allow the wicked to rule your people. Keep our eyes fixed on you so we can have hope for the time of our deliverance and freedom. You have given us this land as an inheritance, and you will surely give it into our hands. Thank you for vindicating us and bringing the wicked to account. Now, those are just two prayers, and there's pages of, of these scriptures and prayers that you can pray. There's a, also another whole chapter on praying for the church, praying for leaders, praying for us as we walk through these things. And so this is words, words to pray by. I am offering, for those who, who watch this video, $5 off. It's usually $20. But if you put in the coupon code fiery arrow, fiery dash arrow, you can get $5 off. Okay. At least for the next week, because I, I want you to be resourced here to, to pray effectively, to pray the word of God. Okay. Because we want to take seriously what the Lord has invited us to. So if you go to wandaalger.me and I'll leave the link below, uh, when it comes up, uh, you know, in the cart, then you can put that coupon code and you'll get $5 off the book and get as many copies as you want. That, that's fine. Um, we need to be armed. And the last thing that I want to exhort you with is because prayer is so strategic in intercession, uh, there is a concerted uh, attack against intercessors right now and prayer leaders. Uh, I have felt it here recently. It's not just, you know, it's not just the prophets who have a target on their back, but it is those who have given themselves to prayer. You know, whether or not you call yourself an intercessor, the, the title isn't as important, but those who know the, know the authority that we have in prayer, and you utilize that on a daily basis, and you're praying for the nation, you're praying for the church, and for these things we've been talking about, uh, the enemy knows that. And Bobby just had a dream last night, and he shared with me this morning, and as we were processing, processing it really briefly before he, he, he went to work, uh, it was very clear, the enemy is watching for those who are giving directives to prayer prayer leaders, pastors, intercessors. And I share that as an invitation. Please be praying over those who have been called to that place of prayer. The prayer movement, prayer right now is under severe attack. I mean, we know even just with the International House of Prayer, that prayer ministry, severe attack. Yes, some of it is God, God's cleaning his house. We know that. But the enemy is using it to try to shut down intercessors and to diminish the role of prayer right now. We can't let that happen. So it means not only us stepping up in prayer, but also covering those who are, you know, organizing prayers and who are giving directives and bringing clarity, even bringing, uh, you know, revelation to prayers. Please be praying. Uh, my own family this last week, uh, four family members, immediate family members, they were all under severe attack in the middle of the night. Two of the men ended up in the ER. Thankfully, they're okay. But it got my attention. And so I put my intercessors on alert. Um, so I share that, uh, not to put fear, but just to know it, it is our covenant relationship with each other and it's our unity in prayer. The enemy can't cross that. Uh, it's not just, you know, us having that authority ourselves. We know that, but especially when we're praying about corporate matters, that corporate authority is so key. Praying with others, being in agreement. That's why praying the word of God is so powerful because there's an automatic agreement that we're praying when we declare the word of the Lord. Uh, prophetic words that we know are of the Lord. You, you continue to decree that because those prophetic words have power in the spirit. And so the more that we unify our voices around those, the enemy can't, can't do anything about it. And when we're together, we provide that safety net as well for, for each other. So uh, I would even welcome you in the comments to to leave a prayer below, you know, in in terms of what I've shared today or even just a prayer of blessing for those who are called to pray uh, that we can stand together because it is uh, very important in these days that, that we live in. So with that, again, you can go to wandaalger.me and uh, check out my newsletter there or even get real time alerts when you can get my uh, words as I post them, you can get them right to your inbox. Please subscribe to these video channels uh, and even hit the notification bell so that you can get immediate uh, notification as to when uh, a new video drops. Please share it with others. Thanks for your comments. And until next time, be greatly blessed.
Hey everyone, this is Wanda Alger, and I am here with Andrew Whalen, founder of Vanquish Prophetic Warriors and a nationally recognized prophet to the nations. We are happy to invite you to an upcoming conference that we're doing April 5 and 6 called Unlocking Prophetic Revelation. It's going to be hosted at Crossroads Community Church in Winchester, Virginia. So Andrew, tell folks what this conference is about. Yes, thank you, Wanda. So Unlocking Prophetic Revelation is tied into the time when Jesus inaugurated his church, his ecclesia in Matthew 16. And in Matthew 16, 19, he says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom and what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And so I feel like this conference is going to be paramount to understand how to advance the kingdom of God to bind and loose in this new era that we are entering into. And the keys of the kingdom have precisely to do with prophetic revelation. And so we want to help you unlock prophetic revelation and then begin to apply it so that we can see the kingdom of God advance, the works of the devil destroyed, and Jesus get all the glory. Amen. Well, that sounds exciting. I want to be there. It's a <laughs> two-day conference. It's going to be live streamed uh, free of charge so anyone can watch, but we would love to see you in person. But because of limited seating and people coming from all over the country, uh, there will be a $25 reservation fee if you want to save your seat. But all the details are available on our website at crossroadswinchester.com. We hope to see you then.